good afternoon, everybody, or indeed good morning or good evening, depending on uh, which uh, time zone you're joining us from. Uh, my name is Calypso Cholkidu. I'm the Director of Global Health Policy and a Senior Fellow at the Centre for Global Development, and I'm currently in my flat in London. Um, I'm also a Professor of Practice in Global Health at Imperial College uh, in London. And uh, today we will be talking about uh, data, about data for better decision making, especially in lower middle income countries, for informing uh, policy modeling uh, on COVID-19. We have with us um, a great panel, colleagues from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, Tufts, and also HITAP, the Thai Priority Setting Agency for the Ministry of Public Health of Thailand and NUS. Uh, and I will introduce them all in due course, but let me uh, say a few words uh, trying to frame what we are trying to achieve here today. Well, of course, uh, COVID-19 has uh, made all the more uh, prominent the choices that policymakers need to make uh, in addressing uh, the crisis. And of course, no country has unlimited resources to address and contain the outbreak, and therefore, uh, decisions have to be made about how finite resources, human resources, money, infrastructure uh, can be allocated, should be allocated to contain the virus. Especially in low and middle income countries, uh, the systems are already overwhelmed uh, by demand, and have been even before the, the outbreak, uh, and the most recent uh, uh, measures in response to the pandemic have even further uh, uh, choked the, the supply and demand in those systems in the healthcare settings. Um, now, we, we are living in a, in a period where evidence-based, evidence-informed policymaking has become uh, more important than perhaps ever before. The COVID tragedy perhaps has opened a window for evidence to inform policymaking on a scale we haven't seen in the past. But um, some of us may perhaps are worried, at least I am, uh, that things may be going, going a bit off track when it comes to the way the evidence actually informs the policy response in high-income countries and indeed in lower- middle-income countries. Um, so I'm saying this because analysis so far, uh, analysis which have been used to inform uh, response measures, uh, especially in developing settings, have been based on disease transmission models developed by and large in high-income settings and communicated through high-income media, most of the time, as a first point of contact. Um, with lower- and middle-income countries, at least so far, though things are changing, and we'll hear about this from our colleagues, uh, with lower- and middle-income country settings as an afterthought. Uh, and part of that is also the lack of data, uh, information, evidence, uh, coming directly from those settings to inform uh, the modeling analysis, which in turn uh, drive policy decisions. And I'm talking about data on health outcomes, of course, and effectiveness of alternative interventions, but also data on economics and ethics and the feasibility of implementing uh, the different pro proposed solutions um, and indeed how those solutions conform, uh, are aligned to local social norms um, and, 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 and how they're communicated to populations uh, as they're being imposed. Further, a lot of the modeling we've seen has been done using proprietary platforms. It's very hard to understand even when the code is, uh, is delivered. Uh, explanatory notes are uh, rare and limited, and the assumptions made underpinning uh, those final results that get publicized, those assumptions a lot of the time remain unclear, and, and so people are uh, l less empowered to challenge them, understand them, let alone challenge them. And then, of course, there's too many of those models and analysis. Uh, there's a lot of them out there, and it's difficult to uh, understand which one is the right model, the right analytical tool for the job. So in response to all of these analyses, a lot of the time, in response, of course, also to a normative guidance coming out of Geneva, the World Health Organization, countries, developing countries have implemented radical measures on an unprecedented scale. Uh, and it's true that in parallel we have very limited ability to course correct based on uh, any monitoring uh, of uh, uh, the impact of those uh, measures. Uh, today we've had the first uh, release here in the UK of uh, Office of National Statistics data uh, on deaths, which actually shows, shows both COVID deaths and excess deaths, and they seem to be on par. Uh, so we're starting to see the health impact a lot more than just the small uh, peak, the health impact of COVID, the COVID 
crisis, both the direct deaths, but also deaths caused by the way we're responding to the crisis. And this is for the UK, and still the, the data are far from clear. It's much harder to do something similar in developing country settings, and we'll talk about that. Uh, and of course, the measures the West is taking to contain the virus has direct implications on the livelihoods and the well-being of, of people, of citizens uh, in lower middle income countries. In the past, we have called at CGD for a process to allow for policymakers to engage with models, with uh, evidence, those who collate the evidence, synthesize it, evaluate it, to engage with them, to question them, to understand them, to work with them. Today we're here to talk about data and uh, a data-based strategy to uh, address the outbreak and, and ideally also a data-based exit strategy uh, not so far in the future. I'm very grateful to all our participants today and um, I'm going to start with our first um, uh, presenter. Uh, we have three colleagues, each one of whom will uh, give a very short five, seven minute uh, uh, presentation um, of, of their work and how it relates to the question of data and evidence-informed policy making in the, in the times of COVID. Uh, we'll start with Dan Ollendorf, uh, who comes from Tufts, and he will talk to us about resource allocation optimization and the evidence base, the, the, the status of the evidence base, uh, because uh, unfortunately um, uh, policymakers around the globe right now lack the crucial information they need on the comparative clinical and cost effectiveness of interventions, public health interventions and clinical interventions to address COVID. Uh, Dan has done a lot of work in this space, uh, previously with ICER in the US and now with Tufts. And uh, Dan, over to you. Um, we'll hear from him and then we'll move on to the other two presenters and then we'll open up for questions amongst the panel and with you all. Again, thank you very much, much for tuning in. And Dan, over to you. Thanks very much, Calypso. And uh, hello, everyone. Delighted to be with you today, virtually at least, um, here from coming to you from Boston in the USA. And so I'll be talking about uh, sort of the historical lens, cost effectiveness of pandemic response and preparedness, preparedness, what do we actually know? So as Calypso mentioned, I direct uh, value assessment and global health initiatives at the Center for the Evaluation of Value and Risk in Health at Tufts. Uh, we are a group of health economists and health services researchers that are focused on uh, infusing value into uh, priority setting and resource allocation decisions. Uh, and as Calypso mentioned, I come to the group with an HTA angle, health technology assessment angle. As part of our work, we manage a couple of registries of published cost effectiveness evidence, and I'll be sharing some data with those uh, from those registries with you. So the first registry I'll talk about is a global health focused registry. This is a database of published English language cost per dolly averted studies. Uh, it is uh, done with support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, so it is a free and public resource. Anyone can access the registry, download the entire data set if you, if, uh, you wish. Uh, the data, uh, as you can see from this graph, have been growing over time. Uh, we have over 750 studies at this point uh, and many more results from each of those studies as well. We also have managed for the past 25 years a cost per quality registry uh, known as the CEA registry. This is a sub subscription-based resource, but you can see as well that over this time, uh, there's been substantial growth in the studies uh, that are published on a cost per quality adjusted life year basis as well. We're also seeing that there is steady state and growth in low and middle income settings. So you'll see here on this graphic, uh, over the past 10 years or so, the trend upward in both uh, dolly-based and quality-based studies in LMICs. Uh, it's hard to um, pin the growth of the quality-based studies in LMICs down to a single reason, uh, but some of those reasons probably have to do with greater capacity for conducting quality-based research in these settings, as well as some potential conversion to non-communicable disease as leading causes of disability and death, uh, and the nuanced approach that uh, quality measurement takes and understanding uh, the health impact may be uh, a reason for that as well. But the question we're here to answer today is whether cost-effectiveness studies focused on outbreak control uh, and prevention uh, mirror those trends. And uh, based on the data I'm going to show you, it's pretty clear that uh, unequivocally the answer is no. 
So quality-based studies um, that have assessed disease control and prevention in our database number only 38. So that's 0.5% of the total volume in the database. And of those, uh, over two-thirds were not policy-based at all. So we're talking today about policy-based interventions to control pandemics and prepare for the next one. But most of the studies in the quality registry are actually based on a single drug, drug or vaccine, not on a comprehensive policy. Uh, the studies of testing, stockpiling, disease suppression do exist, but they're minimal in number, of course. And results have also been highly variable depending on the intervention studied, anywhere from $440 to $15 million per quality gained. So the dolly based studies are also few in number, uh, obviously based on a lower denominator. So the CEA registry, the quality based registry is about 10 times larger. Uh, the dolly based studies are still a relatively small percentage of the total volume. Now, uh, it is the case here that most of those studies were in fact policy based, but there are challenges with this evidence as well. Uh, one such challenge uh, so these are, these are studies of systematic outbreak control, risk mitigation, prevention, uh, and others. Um, and most of these uh, are highly cost effective, but one major challenge is that uh, very few of them have actually fully estimated the cost of implementation and or monitoring. And in a couple of instances, those costs were estimated, but due to budget concerns and constraints, uh, the intervention was not fully funded. So this is obviously a challenge um, that will be ongoing in LMICs. Um, so it's, it's kind of a twin issue of both access to data to actually fully estimate the costs and uh, the challenge of actually realizing the intervention, even if it's fully described. So I have a couple of thoughts on um, the evidence in relation to our current context with the current pandemic. So um, we are seeing in the news and elsewhere the gaps in clinical and public health preparedness kind of play out for us on a daily basis. This is no different than for the use of cost effectiveness analysis to inform mitigation and control. There will be gaps that we have to deal with and there's certainly a clear need for further research. There is an opportunity to build on the, some of the disease modeling efforts that have, have already become public to explore those trade-offs within local context, given uh, the sheer variability in those estimates. And as an example, uh, today's projection for the US coming from IHME in terms of ventilator need is about 15,000. But there's this impossibly wide uncertainty interval of 5,000 to 40,000. And you can, you can imagine that the trade-offs are going to be very different if you're looking at the upper bound of that estimate relative to the lower bound. In addition, um, we also know that these numbers are also crazy large when we're thinking about LMICs, many of whom may have fewer than 10 ventilators in the country uh, at any given time. And so, uh, so the challenges associated with both um, availability of equipment the right approach to take given the resources available, uh, all of this bears further study uh, and is really critically important to help make these decisions uh, as a pandemic like this one is unfolding. So with that, I'll thank you very much for your time. I'll turn it back over to Calypso and uh, very excited to be part of the conversation. Thank you, Dan. We've got with us Anna Vassell, who's a professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and uh, has been, uh, over the past few weeks, uh, very actively involved in the modelling efforts um, and very much at the centre of informing policies in the UK and overseas uh, with her colleagues at the London School and elsewhere. Um, so very, very happy to have you with us, Anna. Um, please, over to you and then we'll open it up for a discussion after you. Thank you. Hi everyone, and, and like Dan, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I direct a group called the Centre of Health Economics in London as part of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. I represent the health economists there, but we also work very closely with the mathematical modellers and the Centre of Mathematical Modelling for Infectious Diseases at the London School. Um, but I'm going to focus today on the economic side and less the disease modelling. I don't know, there was going to be some slides brought up for me. I don't know if Saul is going to uh, uh, pull those slides up. 
or everyone else can see them. Is that good? That's the last slide. I need to go to the beginning, possible. Yeah, back a bit further. Yeah, great. That's the title. So I just didn't introduce myself. So maybe on to the next slide, Saul. So. Okay, great. So I just wanted to start by talking about the policy context in which we're operating. I mean, I'm sure many of you are aware and actually living through this, but at the moment, for a health economist, the, the, we, we've got a wide and sort of interdependent policy choice set. So we've got policy decisions made in the health sector, public health, social care, humanitarian action, social protection, a whole range of things. And normally what we're used to doing is, is operating within one sector. So when we make choices in the health sector, we're deciding which technology to use, and we're assuming everything else is, is, is sort of constant. In this case, we can't, because all these things are really interrelated, as we know what we do in the health sector with ICU beds affects the extent to which we can enact public health interventions, for example, and, and minimize um, death. So we've got these widely sort of interdependent short policy choices in, in the case of COVID. Um, another challenge, I think, is that we're trying to achieve multiple objectives, and sometimes that's not clear how we're trying to trade off those objectives. And again, I think this is probably familiar, and you can all see this happening, the trade off between health and productivity, but also poverty concerns and security concerns. And at the moment, policymakers are also trying to trade off short term decision making with what they know will be the long run trade offs, particularly around the macroeconomy. Now, none of these three things is any different than the job of governments normally. The, in fact, the job of government is to make these trade offs and, and is often making sort of simultaneous choices across different sectors. But in this case, we're doing this substantial changes and rapidly. And particularly what, you, what you're seeing is that the same sort of constraints on each sector. So, for example, health care spend is not as fixed as it normally is. And there are sort of rapid shifts between sectors as well. Um, and also these decisions have been made in, in, in a very data scarce environment. We're going to come back to that, um, you know, we're making the decisions with really four months data available. Um, and I suppose the other thing I want I want to highlight is these policy decisions are, are sort of moving what are commonly private decisions that we make about our own well-being and our balance between health and employment and actually shifting them for, to the public domain because of the externalities involved in pandemics. So. We're in a time where policy is made as high risk policy. It's not just highly uncertain, but the consequences of getting it wrong are severe. And, and, and that's the kind of decision environment we're trying to inform with our data and analysis. So could I have the next slide, please? OK, so getting a bit more more focus on the kind of data needs and, 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 and what we're trying to do at the moment. So as Calypso said, most of the work to date has either come out of China or um, Southeast Asia or the high income countries. And the work for low and middle income countries has, has lagged behind. I mean, having said that, we're seeing work emerge. I think the work did actually start about three or four weeks ago. So perhaps it's not as lagged as people think, but it's really now beginning to come into the public domain. There are some real challenges um, in, in doing this work, and there are kind of three sets of specific questions we're trying to answer. I think the first one is trying to understand for lower middle income countries how the relationship between the intervention and the duration and peak of the epidemic on mortality and productivity, how those things interact, and are they the same in lower middle income countries as they are in high income countries? Some of the areas that data is being collected on to inform that, one of the issues is to start with epidemiology. Do different countries have with different comorbidities and different risk factors have the same case fatality rates in high income countries? There's two groups currently exploring the issue. And I think one um, one of our my colleagues from CMID published on, on, on that today. The other issue which you'll see driving the models is an understanding of social contacts and household structure and mixing between populations, which obviously affects the extent of transmission. Um, at the moment, I think looking at the imperial work, there's only sort of eight current studies they're using from lower middle income countries that describe how populations mix. Again, we need much more data and understanding of that. The, the next area is understanding health sector capacity. 
Um, we've all talked about sort of improving ICU beds. How quickly can we do that? What are the four, the ways in which we can do that? But importantly, in lower middle income countries, well, importantly, everywhere, but more, perhaps more of a worry in lower middle income countries is if hospital beds are not used electively, but actually already being used for emergencies or or severe acute illness. What are the opportunity costs when you start to switch usage to COVID? So I think that's a, a question we need more understanding on. And I won't go through all of these, but just because of time, but you can see I've listed some of the other areas that I think people are concerned about at the moment and trying to gather and understand um, to be able to really determine that relationship between the epidemic intervention and its consequences. Um, so maybe going to the next slide. OK, I think sort of once you understand those general relationships, we start to get a handle on them. I, I think we also have some quite specific questions about interventions that other people are working on. Um, I think, I mean, again, there, there's a whole range of interventions. Some of the work that I've seen is how best to shield the vulnerable in lower middle income countries compared to high income countries. Who are those vulnerable people? With, you know, how practically and physically can they be shielded? Um, when we look at critical care, looking at different models of care that are not so ICU dependent, but looking at sort of more generalized hospital beds with additional oxygen supply, are there better ways of doing that? Are there ways of protecting health workers beyond PPE, perhaps moving, uh, sort of actually allocating hospitals to COVID and have non-COVID hospitals where you can't manage your, your infection control in different ways? So I think in addition to understanding these big relationships, there's a lot of work sort of beginning to, to go on about what kind of intervention models might be most effective. And finally, I think you've seen work which will come out. I've seen some webinars on this as well in terms of how do we balance these different trade offs and how do we have processes that allow decision makers to do this and particularly looking to the future of how we ensure as new technologies come online, we assume that they're fairly and equitably distributed amongst populations. So next slide, please. So I've talked a bit about the questions and the environment in which we're operating. I mean, the next thing is what models do we have? How do we feed, you know, do we just have this data descriptively? Obviously, there's statistical models, but just talking a little bit about the mechanistic models that are being used to answer these questions. We have three sorts, but these all overlap. We have infectious disease models, and that's what you probably see mo where you see most of the publications today. And often they include estimates of resort use, primarily bed use and not so far sort of other use such as healthcare workers or other constraints, which may be just as applicable in lower middle income countries, but primarily focusing on ICU beds. Then you have macroeconomic evaluation models, the kind of cost effectiveness analysis that people are used to. And I'm just going to in the next slide show you some examples of those who come out. I think Dan made a very nice summary of the evidence to, to date, but there are some studies emerging. So here, it, uh, maybe if you go back, I was just going to finish that slide and then move on to this slide. That's OK. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. And then the last one is just to highlight macroeconomic modeling. So I'm not going to talk too much about that, but there has been experience of of sort of merging macroeconomic models with estimates of, or, or with sort of, and, and, and seeing how they work when you um, explore the effects of pandemics on those models. So there's been some work on that, but often, at least, I don't, there's only sort of one area in malaria where they've really been able to link infectious disease modeling to macroeconomic modeling. So, um, but there is work ongoing looking at how, how that can be done. Um, so, next slide. I didn't want to um, sum. Next slide, please. Um, I didn't want to sum all. I, I don't have time in a few minutes just to sum all the literature, but I thought I oh, uh, but I thought I would allow. Um, and then going back to the last slide, but I thought at least if this webinar was recorded, I'd give you a screenshot of some of the work coming out of date. So we could just go back to the last slide. Sorry, it's jumping around a bit. It's it's I think it's difficult the moving a slide, so at least there's a screenshot. So here is some of the work that, that, that those of you who are watching or watching the recording can start to look at if you're interested in the area. You have the estimates from Imperial at the beginning, also from the London School. So these are giving you um, examples of when the peak and what the, uh, will, will start in, in Africa and lower middle income countries. There are many more studies of this, but this is a good starting point. 
um, the two studies by Shilomi and, and Wang and Kanon, they're beginning to look at microeconomic uh, models and they're really looking at the cost effectiveness of global kind of lockdown approaches versus more um, test, uh, sort of testing and contact traces and, and focused isolation approaches. And then there's some quite interesting papers. Greenstone is a good example of that, which instead of looking at metrics of health, actually start to incorporate how we value health compared to other areas of the economy. So there's some interesting reading coming out. All this work is, as you see, not peer, much of it isn't peer reviewed. It's been done very rapidly with some quite simple assumptions, but I think is showing that we're beginning to address this effort. And I'm sure if we look at this in two weeks time, there'll be 20 or 30 references like this. Um, just to say as well, at the bottom, there are two sets of references that over time you'll start to see us tracking um, more resources coming and, and, and there for your references to, to going forward. And then my last slide, and I'll finish now the time, if I could just have the last slide. Thank you. So I think my last point I wanted to make is that we're doing this very rapidly on three or four months data, but actually as a community, at least of health economists, we have huge resources to lean on that we need to make more use of. Um, we have processes in place in low and middle income countries, and I'm sure you will speak to this about how we begin to look at evidence from different sources. Um, and can we piggyback on those processes, those HGA processes that we currently use um, and adapt them? We also have considerable expertise on how we measure health impact and how we deal with equity. And again, I would be great to see um, more work applying this sort of current knowledge to the current COVID epidemic. I think Calypso will, will pick up on that. Um, for those, one of the barriers is, is for economists is accessing and understanding infectious disease modeling. I mean, the, the infectious disease models are scarce and most of them are extremely overworked at this moment and hard to link up with, not because of lack of willingness, but because the demands on their, their resources are so constrained at the moment. However, I know at least two groups which are looking to to um, release open source model codes shortly within the next week or two that those economists who know are and know a bit about infectious disease models can begin to look at and apply to their settings. I've also seen examples where they're releasing data, for example, the imperial data on the peaks in each country is available from their website. And within countries, there are many local math mathematical modelers who may be a less familiar with infectious diseases, but offer a partnership to economists and other people taking a broader approach. So I think there will be options, but um, and I and just encourage the sort of economic community to explore those linkages with modelers. Um, and I think I'll, I'll stop there. I mean, we can talk later about um, the data and how to perhaps gather some of the data required for the models. And, and thank you very much for letting me speak. Thank you, Anna. And just to, uh, before I pass it over to Yacht, uh, just to those of you watching, uh, please, if you have questions, uh, either tweet at CGDev uh, with the hashtag CGTalks, uh, submit your comments via YouTube, or email us at uh, events at CGDev.org. Thank you. Uh, Yacht has been um, leading the work of HITAP, which is the Health Interventions and Technology Assessment Program in Thailand since its beginning. He's uh, the founder of the agency, uh, mm -hmm. and he has been uh, working on this uh, interface between modeling and other types of evidence synthesis and policy making, informing uh, the very successful uh, universal coverage scheme in Thailand, but also uh, more broadly working with countries in the region and beyond on what Anna described as uh, evidence-informed decision-making processes, health technology assessment processes uh, around the world. So, Yacht, over to you. And just to say thank you very much for joining us despite the lateness of the time for you in Bangkok. And I appreciate there's a curfew coming, coming on <laughs> soon. So hopefully we'll finish on time. And thank you. Over to you, Yacht. Thank you, Calypso. And thank you for my colleagues for me to speak today. So maybe I we heard uh, from uh, my panelist uh, Dan and Anna talking about the availabilities and the challenge in making good quality of evidence. But I want to, to share my idea that it's not only to have a, a good evidence that can lead to a better decisions. It's not going to be straightforward and simple. Um, uh, for hypothesis like this. 
But in fact, uh, I borrow uh, ideas and ideas of change. I think this comes from our uh, almost a decade experience working uh, in, uh, on capacity building on um, priority setting in low and middle income countries. What we learned is that uh, not only evidence that we needed to make a better decision, but we need also a better process. The better process is mean that uh, we, we allowed uh, evidence generators or researchers to better understand what decision maker want, but at the same time, it's also allowed decision maker to understand what researchers is doing and buying and making trust in the event. Uh, so the process in our uh, ideas criteria of change is, is, is a central piece uh, and also uh, always a missing piece of work that we need to do. Um, if you look at the, the, the way that uh, evidence lead to a decision in a high income country, you will see that a lot of uh, investment on the process. But uh, when we talk about uh, bringing evidence into policy decision in low and middle income countries, you see that not only the country th themselves, but also even global donors try to ignore the importance of process. Um, so I, I make a, a few list of the issues to be considered when we are trying to to support uh, low and middle income countries to make a better uh, decision and uh, trying to make a better health based on the evidence they have. So again, uh, again I, I'd say we should know what is the process needed to ensure better evidence leading to better decision in uh, low and middle income countries. If you do this, you will be better understand what are the policy equations that local decision makers are addressing. So you understand them and then a uh, researcher then can understand what type of data do decision maker need to answer these questions. I give you an example of uh, of this slide uh, that um, the modeling evidence may need uh, in uh, different type of modeling evidence need for a different uh, process in time for uh, response to pandemic. At the beginning of the pandemic or even before the pandemic in the countries uh, maybe these makers want the modeling data to set agenda to make awareness uh, and to make the issues high in political agenda and also to pop, to formulate the policy. But after they already on board and the public already aware of the importance of the, the pandemic, we may need uh, model model or, or or modeling evidence to help them evaluate the the measures that they are doing and perhaps also adjust if they are not doing good enough based on the trend based on the, the data that they gather from the field and also once they have a better control of the pandemic we may also need the modeling to project in the future what policies uh, for the exit strategies and then they can also keep e evaluating whether the policy is on the right way Apart from that, we also uh, need to think about how should the modelers communicate the uncertainty involved in modeling. We, we heard from Dan and, and Anna again that uncertainty is really high for, for modeling of these kind of situations. And we, we really need a very good way to communicate things for uncertainty to the decision maker and then also to the public. And I, I will go uh, with some example for this point. And how can decision makers receive continuous support from uh, modelers? As the previous slide showed, that the the, mo the the modeling work is not going to be one off, but it needs to be a continuous process between researcher and decision maker that they are going to support each other along the way. And so, how should modelers disseminate the modeling results? Recently, I found so many um, modelers come to the public media and trying to communicate uh, about modeling results to uh, public media rather than um, going to talk to decision maker in uh, decision making uh, forums. So I give you this one of examples, even though it's not in Thailand, but I just curious and I, I'm. I'm looking forward because I believe that the similar data will be available for Thailand and for many countries in Southeast Asia or in Africa again. 
So you you can see that when when decision makers uh, not decision maker when the public sees this kind of information that you say when is the peak of the pandemic and how much people are going to die in that day. First, is, I think is people will make public uh, scare. Second one is that if decision maker they will be wonder what, what what should we do after that should. This is the end of the pandemic, and then the public will be relaxed and asking the government, I mean, to relax the policy, even though it's a lot of uncertainty is surrounding this this kind of information. So I I think we need to make a balance between uh, uh, make, be, making public interested about the data and and making the public understand the situations. Again, for, for example, about uncertainty, a lot of uncertainty for this kind of situation. How can you, how can you do, you, I, I give some example of one uh, religious leader in India that can make 40,000 people in quarantines. So I don't know how many people infected, but in Thailand, only one event in boxing stadium that lead to more than hundreds of uh, COVID cases in Thailand. So this kind, of, I, I think, is very difficult to model and really difficult to predict. And let alone about the, the, the supply size in healthcare that perhaps it will be even more challenging for modeling that if we need to close down important hospital because many staff uh, get infected and, and that the debt can be, can be increased significantly because of the shutdown of, uh, the shutting down of the hospital. How we model this kind and how we communicate about these uncertainties. So the last part is that, as I'm informed, that I, I hope that this is uh, going to be beginning of uh, low and middle income countries to become more interested in invest, more on modeling work, on priority setting evidence. So what should be done to ensure long-term sustainability of modeling work, of priority setting work, to support policy decision in low and middle income countries after COVID pandemic? I think this set of uh, question perhaps it may be worthwhile to think, uh, not only uh, researcher, but uh, I mean, uh, internationals uh, and global donors and even uh, the decision maker themselves. So over to you, Calypso. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yacht. And in fact, uh, this is a great list of questions to get us started also amongst the panel before we turn to, um, to colleagues. Uh, you've highlighted the importance of communicating uncertainty, communicating, and, and indeed communicating uncertainty, and this is indeed hugely important in the context of making policy decisions which have a direct and indirect impact in the immediate and longer term on people's lives, millions or billions of lives around the world. So I think that's an important point I'd like to come back to. But let me uh, make a few more comments before we open it up. So we've talked and uh, uh, Anna helpfully put up a list of uh, modeling efforts from around the world. There's a lot more. Obviously, there's IHME, which uh, you showed as a screenshot of Yacht. Uh, there's uh, IDM. Uh, there's uh, the University of Basel, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, Imperial College. There's a number of universities in South Africa I know of, um, WITS and, uh, and Sakima and um, um, uh, and others, UCT, uh, working on this, uh, these issues, uh, Moru in Thailand, et cetera, et cetera, Oxford here in the UK again. So Cooper Smith, a number of, uh, of colleagues trying to model out uh, from different perspectives, as Anna explained to us, uh, the uh, impact of uh, the epidemic and indeed of the alternative measures on health. So we have that. Uh, however, if your presentations, all three of your presentations, have flagged the uh, lack of data and, and evidence from countries of, of interest whose uh, decisions are being informed by these analyses, lack of data to inform those analyses. So, for example, uh, yeah, as Anna said, we've, we've been using very much data from China, for instance, and now most uh, recently from northern Italy uh, to model out um, uh, policies uh, which are currently being rolled out in places like India or, or sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so how do you source this information and how do you source the right type of information to address questions, policymakers' questions such as, for instance, you know, how long do we shut the economy down for? Uh, what do we do? Do we shut the economy completely? Do we, do, do we go into complete lockdown curfew? Uh, 
Uh, and if we do, when do we lift it? If we don't, what are the alternatives between sort of complete inaction and the extreme uh, shutdown that uh, many countries we see are doing? And most importantly, something we've been talking about a lot, CGD, the, the importance of net health impact. So, and when we talk about net health impact, this is not just about uh, the direct deaths caused by COVID, uh, which are, of course, very important and need to be prevented and are all working towards preventing those deaths or, or at least reducing the numbers of some inevitable deaths, but at the same time, uh, trying uh, to manage deaths uh, because of uh, the way the healthcare systems uh, respond, either because they're overwhelmed uh, by the, uh, the, the outbreak or indeed because services are shut down uh, in an effort to minimize the effects of the outbreak. And that's what we mean by excess deaths. So these excess mortality numbers that have come out uh, uh, today in, uh, in the UK re refer precisely to that. So how many people uh, didn't have their stroke? Uh, looked, looked after or their heart attack or their emergency asthma attack. Uh, and indeed, as we go forward, how many people missed their cervical cancer screening? How many people uh, missed their chemotherapy or their diabetes treatment? And they will go on to then develop complications and die in the next six months and, and beyond. In developing settings, even more acute situations of the cholera outbreak, a measles outbreak in Central Africa, which is killing people right now because vaccination campaigns have stalled, or maternal deaths spiking because people can't get to services uh, because of the curfews, um, or TB notifications falling by 80% in, in South Asia and India, uh, which of course will result in many more people getting the disease, contracting it, transmitting it, and dying of it because they're no longer uh, recorded and, uh, and looked after. So. This is what we mean by the direct, the net health impact. And, and I guess my first question to you all, and I'll start perhaps with, with you, Anna. Whilst we're uh, in this first wave, which are not doing very well as a, as a planet trying to uh, tackle the outbreak, we're all shutting down, waiting to try and understand how this thing works and how we manage. What sort of data ought to be trying to collect? What sort of information should global uh, partners and indeed national players, especially in developing countries and in developed as well. I think we're in this uh, together. What sort of information are critical? You put a list out there, but if you were to pick the key sources that drive this uncertainty, uh, what sort of information should we be trying to get our hands on to inform um, uh, the models as, as you put them together and try to understand the trade-offs? Over, over to you, uh, Anna, and then open it to, to Yacht and Dan as well. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it, it, that's a very difficult question because they're numerous and it's really hard for us to understand at the moment which are most important. And I think that's one of the things that the models which emerge from low and middle income countries will begin to tell us what is really driving the uncertainty. And at the moment, that's quite clear. But you mentioned some. Um, I think talking at the health sector capacity, you mentioned about opportunity costs. At the moment, we're making we're getting much better idea of current capacity. There's health facility maps which are coming out. There's there's better estimates of ICU bed days. Before it was just extrapolations across settings, but I think many of our global partners and local partners are sharing that information and finding that information out quickly. But what we know less about is exactly what you say, Calypso, as how much space can we actually take up in those hospitals without having very high opportunity costs to other sectors. So we need much more information, not just about the number of beds, but how they're used. I think models of how you staff those beds and other types of, so again, the focus is all on beds, but not the things that go on around beds. <laughs> I think more understanding of other supply sort of side constraints, as in key critical supplies, PPE, you know, is talked about, but testing, we have very little idea of the costs of of testing to the extent that may be required as a as an alternative to the kind of lockdown policies. How much you know will low and middle income countries be able to test, and how much will they that cost them to set up that infrastructure? So I think there's a whole set of supply side questions which we have, you know, protocols from the WHO on how you should do things, but not really a clear picture of what the true incremental costs and opportunity costs are. Um, I think of the the other areas you talk about, the one that I'm particularly interested in is how households cope and actually households sort of cost. So not so much. I mean, I say all these things are really important, but perhaps you've got the macroeconomic impact and models emerging of which sectors will be affected. But for me, is how individual households in different societies and different settings are coping with these shocks, how 
you're getting transfers across generations, how you're having people deplete their assets and, and, and how they're surviving and how long they can survive and before getting into a point of economic catastrophe and also mapping that to the social protection systems, the formal and informal ones that do it, it exist in different countries. So I'm very focused on basically social protection capacity and health system capacity. I think that's my bias. It's not necessarily that those things are most important, but that's what I'd like to see more data on. Thank you. Dan, Yeah, I might, um, yeah I might throw in a thought, and, and I'm on, on a bit of dangerous ground because I'm not a clinician, but uh, one of the interesting threads that I, I'm observing is that there there really there's sort of a scatter shot, and this is probably not unusual with uh, with a lot of emerging or poorly understood disease. But there's sort of the scatter shot um, distribution of information about new clinical knowledge that's being developed as this disease is being managed. One of the articles I read this morning uh, suggests that there may be other ways to deal with airway management in these patients than simply putting them on a ventilator, and that's because most of them or many of them are different than what you would normally see in terms of someone who has to go on a ventilator. They're not uh, disoriented. They're not um, heavily compromised or with a lot of comorbidities. They can be younger and alert, and they're simply having their oxygen levels being depleted. And so uh, probably out of necessity with some areas where there's ventilator shortage, clinicians are trying to manage the airway uh, differently in these patients before uh, uh, before going to a ventilation situation. And so that actually has a lot of implications for LMICs who may not have the resources available, uh, but that information is not centralized. It's not being distributed in, in a clear way as a new understanding is being developed of the disease. And so uh, I think that information is, is critical coming from the HTA world generally. I certainly agree with the points about uncertainty. Um, HTA struggles to convey uncertainty even when there's the luxury of time and deliberation and when um, we're in sort of a more immediate situation like this one, uh, that becomes much more important. So uh, I think that uh, true leadership um, implies conveying data along with that uncertainty to the public to say, here is what we know, here's what we don't know, and here are the steps that should be taken. Thank you. Thank you. Yacht, any thoughts? Uh, yes, I I think it depends on the the, the um, question that you're trying to answer. Uh, if you're trying to answer the question that related to COVID, I tend to agree with Anna that perhaps uh, we need to know how much we underestimate or overestimate. I think more or less in the middle income countries, we are underestimate the case, but we don't really know how much. But I, I, I do believe the date is we trying to count every date. In Thailand so far, we have less than 40 people dying from this uh, disease. So I, I think we put a lot of effort trying to count every date in detail. But at the same time, if you like to look at a, a broader perspective, like a health system, for example, I I think we're trying to focus on one disease, but this doesn't mean that um, other people are not dying from other disease. I mean, every day we still a lot of people are dying from um, maybe a complication from pregnancies, still people dying from NCD, still people dying from HIV, TB, malaria, etc. And and uh, when we are not listen to those kind of bad news, but we are trying to focus on one thing that is, I think is quite dangerous. But even more dangerous when you are looking at now is, I think most of the country, including Thailand, the whole government looking on only one disease uh, and health system is now is central of everything that government is thinking and talking mm -hmm. to. So for non-health sector, I think that is also a big thing. Malnutrition still perhaps in many cases uh, in many countries, especially in South Asia and Africa. And that is, is a long term, but it doesn't mean that it's not going to make a, a big difference if we're trying to do so. I think those kind of things that unknown 
ignorance and perhaps uh, underestimate that is i think is perhaps is a, is the the job of people like us who try i think to less to the society thank you Yod. in fact we've got some questions from uh our audience and uh, a couple of them are addressed to you, Yacht, and link very much to what you just said about uh, other deaths, uh, about the health system, health systems approach, and how we manage on one hand to uh, contain the outbreak, save lives, uh, whilst also having this health systems perspective. So, uh, a colleague asks, um, can you talk perhaps uh, about how HITAP, the government of Thailand, IHPP, um, have uh, have been able over the years to combine evidence from different sectors to inform policies um, and, uh, and, and perhaps how this sort of multi-sectoral approach that Anna set out as being very important uh, sort of is operationalized, if you like, in the Thai setting. And a side question to this, if I may also, uh, again, from one of our colleagues uh, watching us, is data transparency. Governments are sensitive about data. Uh, perhaps sometimes some people might argue certain governments, perhaps in emerging uh, economies, may be even more sensitive about their data and about sharing their <laughs> data. Uh, so how do you tackle that? How do you work with that? Over to you, Yacht. Okay, thank you. I try to... There are so many questions I try to address. First is, I think, it's, um, uh, I think it's one thing is perhaps it's going to be the same for every country in this case which is a really obvious uh, situation that I think most decision makers now asking for evidence. I think perhaps one thing, because this thing is, I mean, COVID-19 is really new. So no one know before, and you cannot find really expertise in the country. So everybody uh, can pay a part, uh, and decision maker really open-minded to listen to uh, many groups. Uh, I would say in Thailand, it's, it's not only IHPP and HITAP, but both of us are uh, within the Minister of Public Health, and we have uh, a good relationship and long-term relationship. We are part of Minister of Public Health, so we, we work with decision makers for a long time. So we now we are part of a uh, Minister of Public Health uh, intelligent unit. But we need to work with every single department with, within the Minister of Public Health because it is the thing that is so big, it is very high on political agenda. So we work with Department of Disease Control who are also paying the important law since the first day. And this is a Department of Medical Science, Medical Service, Department of, even Department of Health. So everybody is working together under a uh, different form of uh, 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 functions and institutions. So, uh, but how we work uh, in Thailand, I would say, uh, we work first is based on our own experience and we try to do research and, and it's, it's really challenging. We, we, we need to uh, develop our own research to address some policy questions. For example, now I tap uh, at the Department of Disease Control and, and uh, Department of Medical Science, we're trying to find a way to uh, minimize or to shorten uh, a, a time for quarantine for our health professional because we, we know that if we quarantine them for 14 days, only less than 1% people will develop signs and symptoms after uh, after that. But sometime in lower middle income countries, we cannot afford that. Now we are shutting down a few hospitals because we need to quarantine 100 of doctors and nurses and we think that 14 days may be unaffordable. So we're trying to find a way, but it's dangerous to just say, okay, I cut down to seven or 10 days. So we need evidence. So that kind, and we don't find any evidence outside Thailand. So we need to conduct our own research. But for some other, I think we are really lucky uh, that we have many good colleagues and friends who are working in Hong Kong, in Singapore, in UK, or in other countries that are also really kind to sharing information to us. So if sometime we got uh, an urgent policy question from the government, we email them and then they they come back to us within an hour. So that is really prestigious for us, and I think it's very grateful. So, so we we get a daily basis a policy question from the government, and we need to address them sometime within twenty four hours. So that is that is the the, the challenge for multi multi sectoral approach. I think this is I think the the again this is a very obvious situation when now the government formed. Uh, uh, a multi-sectoral uh, uh, committees consisted of 
all ministry working together, and we are central part of of that committee. So we are working together with, uh, for example, Minister of Foreign Affairs. Still, we this afternoon I get a call from my colleague who's saying that there are still more than ten thousand actually actually a lot twenty thousand Thai people who are overseas and want to come back. But now we are shutting down. We not allow them to fly in, and we will try to release. But we need to be well prepared that how we can get them in, and we have state quarantine, and they can come in any any channel. But how can we, how how can we get a place for them, and how can we ensure that they come and they not uh, uh, make uh, again the 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 uncontrollable outbreak in in country, etc. So so we we need to work closely with them. I think after COVID, um, I believe uh, the way the government working will be changing for forever. Over to you. Interesting. Um, so a question for all three of you. Uh, we, we hear a lot about countries stopping their or posing their immunization campaigns. Um, and Anna, you talked about uh, cost benefit. Uh, Dan, uh, you've, you've highlighted the limited number of studies on this. But from a cost benefit perspective or net mortality impact, does it make sense to stop vaccinating people? And how does one uh, deal with this kind of policy question, uh, which has an impact on mortality immediately? as we've seen with the outbreaks in Central Africa and elsewhere, but also in the medium term. Um, let me start with Anna and then Dan. Yeah, I just have, I mean, this is something I haven't looked at specifically, but my colleague Mark Jitt at the London School has, and I actually in the, the list that I, I put up there of the references, there's one reference at the top of that, that he tries to model out the effect on childhood immunization and says actually the risk of transmission is less than from COVID that you should still go through and, and immunize because of the long-term gains in, in terms of re reducing immune, you know, of, of vaccinating children and preventing other diseases. So th I think there are people who are exploring um, these trade-offs and that's the first example of a study that's, that I've l looked at at doing this. Um, and I think definitely if we're looking at interventions, I mean, in, in that case, he's saying that it's a, it should go ahead. But if we're looking at interventions um, that reduce COVID, we look at the opportunity cost that they will stop other things, um, that, that COVID sort of treating people with COVID will prevent treatments of other areas. But one of the advantages of actually containing COVID is that you can continue with the rest of your public health campaigns. It's not our, our sort of if you like, our status quo is now a COVID uh, world and not a non-COVID world. We don't have that option. And given we have COVID, that's actually a gain from improving the situation with COVID is that we can do all the rest of the public health interventions we, we want to do. So I think, you know, if there can be two ways this can be dealt with in the analysis. But I, I would recommend look at that report and I'm sure we'll see others which are more country specific as we go forward. I think... Uh... I would agree with that, um, although maybe I would add in a yes, but. And so in certain contexts, of course, if um, if quarantine or suppression is not optimal and the health workforce has to be diverted to manage uh, flare ups or outbreaks of COVID-19, uh, those same workers who might be delivering immunization um, wouldn't be available to do it. So I think it, the reality on the ground uh, may be different than the idealized approach. But in general, it seems as though uh, the opportunity costs associated with stopping broad-based immunization um, are greater than the gains from, uh, from doing so in response to the current pandemic. Thank you. Uh, Jot, what's the situation in Thailand? Have you posed uh, vaccination campaigns? There is something that we never talk, but uh, we discuss in our uh, intelligence unit about the seasonal inf uh, influenza. And we decided to go ahead with health professionals and people who already in hospital. But we try to put it off for the last, for example, uh, elderly who are now at home and uh, for young children's po population. So we say perhaps we let see in you know, the next few months, even though the, the vaccine already arrived in Thailand. So we go ahead with health professionals and the people already admit in hospital. This is actually, again, this is showing uh, uh, the approach that we borrow from our colleagues from Singapore and Hong Kong when we are consulting them. 
uh, no no one know which one is better at the moment mm -hmm. the most expert in the world only six months ahead of us so i think it's a very obvious time that everybody is on quite on the same pages Absolutely. And I think that's the important uh, point to make. I think from, my, from what I've taken away so far in the conversation, we've got a few more questions uh, from our audience, but it's that it shouldn't be a binary choice. And as, as, uh, and as you said just now, this is not about COVID versus non-COVID. So can we ignore the situation we're in currently and instead continue doing everything else? Or can we just uh, look in a very static way at opportunity costs? Because of course, COVID is an infectious disease, a virus, and uh, it evolves dynamically and it has knock-on effects on human resources, providers, et cetera, et cetera. So things are interrelated and it's not either or. And in fact, if, uh, well, if there's one criticism perhaps of the earlier models, and they were very, very open, this is modelers very openly acknowledge that they explicitly sort of exclude ethics and economics or net head benefits from their modeling. They look at, uh, at the disease and model out how the disease progresses. And I think it's for policymakers and indeed other scientists to come together and synthesize from different sources information to offer policymakers some scenarios they can work with. So I think a call uh, for common sense and for data collection to allow for course correction as you go forward with this, as opposed to extreme positions of either, well, we shouldn't do anything or indeed we stay at home forever until everything goes away or a vaccine is in place. I think we need to be able to have that nuanced position uh, and that nuanced position has to be informed by evidence. Uh, and I think, as Jot said, uh, the most experts amongst us are only a few months ahead. Uh, there's great uncertainty. And so being able to collect this real world data and model out alternative scenarios, uh, incorporating as much input um, from different perspectives as we can uh, would be would be very important. And a question for you, an interesting question. You mentioned the malaria model as being one example where perhaps the only example where disease modeling uh, managed to uh, to become part of, to plug into macroeconomic models and link to productivity, etc. But um, the question we have from uh, the audience is whether there are any, any examples where um, uh, they uh, we've had a sort of a modeling approach uh, in the high income countries, which has been uh, directly transferred in low middle income countries, which elements of this high income country sort of models could be transferred, which elements ought to be adapted, uh, what's just not directly relevant. And do you know of any examples so far from COVID, uh, or indeed I would say from any other situations where uh, data modeling has directly informed uh, decision making? Um, um, in, in developing nations? Do we know, have we managed to uh, observe that sort of chain of uh, models and evidence synthesis informing policy responses uh, and how has that worked? Okay, lots of questions there like yours. It's like you might have to remind me of some of them as I go forward. So just, just to be really clear, when I was talking about the malaria and the macroeconomic model, that's the only time, or at least that I'm aware of, where the dynamic nature of malaria has fed into a macroeconomic model. That doesn't mean that people haven't modeled pandemics and their consequence on the macro e economy. It's more that they've taken static outputs. They haven't looked at the feedbacks between the economy and the disease and the economy and disease. I think that's, that's what's been missing. But there are examples from the U UK of looking at flu pandemic modeling on the macro economy. And if we actually look at low and middle income countries, there's a whole history with HIV. I mean, it seems like a long time ago, but when we first experienced the HIV pandemic, and there was a whole set of macroeconomic modeling of, of the impact of HIV on e e e economies that I think we should look forward. Because you mentioned Calypso, um, you know, this, this lack in data. Um, I mean, I think the modeling community needs to now very clearly specify its, its, its data needs. But actually, some of the data, as you say, is real time being collected. But there's a lot of data on health systems or data in the past. We're using our old cost data <laughs> to inform what we're doing that's sitting there that can be repurposed for this effort. And I think there's still a huge game from, you know, being very clear about what data is out there that maybe is not COVID specific, but, but could be used in COVID type models about health systems responses from the past. So it's not that we need entirely new data, though, though we also need that. Your question about whether models can be adapted for low and middle income countries. 
Um, I mean, yes, of course. I think what I'm seeing now, and this is sort of more behind the scenes, is actually that many low and middle income countries are doing, um, I would say, fairly simple infectious disease models, because precisely as Yacht is saying, they're being asked by their governments to provide very quick answers tomorrow. They're not waiting for Imperial IHME or the London School to generate global estimates. They are creating simple Excel, you know, infectious disease models, which need some guidance, but are not necessarily wholly wrong. And they are being used. They're being used. You know, I know they're being used. I don't want to name countries, but I, I, I know at least five countries where those models are being used and, and informing decisions. And some of the global groups are also, I mean, we've shared some of our preliminary results, which aren't in the public domain directly with countries. I think that's one of the things we're trying to do before releasing them publicly is ensuring that there's a feedback between the governments of those countries, particularly when we are predicting epidemic curves, which are quite shocking. And, and you want to be very clear how they're communicated to the public in those countries. And particularly if you're outside the countries, there's a great worry that you get that wrong. So actually, I think there is I, I, it's it's nowhere near enough. I think we listed at the London School. We have 100 requests from different countries for specific modeling questions. But there is also substantial work go, going on. And it's not so much an adaptation. What we're seeing is a community of people who are sharing their data, trying to comment as far as they can on each other's models to get them ship shape as quickly as as they can at the moment. I'm not sure if that answered all your 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 questions, <laughs> so or the questions from the audience. Uh, I hope so. If not, come back. Thank me. you, thank you. Now uh, there's a lot coming through, and I'm trying to go through as much as as possible. Uh, Yacht, over to you. Do you have any comments, thoughts? Um, there's the one specific model. point, perhaps, for 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 you in particular. Uh, do you think uh, the COVID crisis is actually an opportunity? Do you think there'll be more transparency, more data sharing, more evidence-informed policymaking? Or do you think um, things will backfire and people will perhaps, uh, both the public, the media, but most importantly, policymakers, perhaps will come away from this uh, uh, trusting less in science than, than before? Um, over to you, and then I'll pass I, over to, to Dan for his thoughts. I, I would say uh, for... People who were working in low and middle income countries, when we always trying to say that uh, government give less priorities on health, now it's no longer your excuse to say that it is not an important. I believe even after COVID, the government still look back and trying to think what they can do more in health sectors to prepare for the next pandemic. So I think this is, is one in a century is, um, uh, crisis that uh, will be for sure is a crisis for country. But uh, as we as we know that we always try not to let the crisis go west. So we try to 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 find opportunity. And I think one of the very good opportunity for um, uh, people in low middle income countries first is that to ensure the, that the government will no longer ignore the importance of health sector. Uh, and in, obviously, you can see that health, if there are something wrong in the health sector, it can be wrong in uh, macroeconomic too. So, in the who know in the future, Minister of Public Health will be part, or Minister of Health will be part of maybe the uh, the economic committee of the government of every government. They need to get the health system right. Second one is that perhaps uh, I think evidence obviously is as I already mentioned that this time every. Everyone, even the country that you have very strong government, you have very strong leader who never listen to anything. But this time they need to listen to experts. They need to listen to, to, uh, statisticians. They need to listen to epidemiologists. They need to listen to economists. So I hope this is you pave way and you make them addicted with the evidence and they will ask for, for more. Uh, so don't let them down trying to, to, to do your best and ensure that they, can no longer live without you. And then the last one is, if I may, because I guess I also champion for a universal health care coverage. Even the Thai Minister of Public Health, also PMAC, et cetera, we, we do promote universal health care coverage. And this time you will see, there is no any event to prove that universal health care coverage is vital for countries and vital for global communities. Uh, the country that already have universal health care coverage, you can see that they are better cope with the pandemic. So I hope that this is a, a good lesson learned for for country that without universal health care coverage. Over to you. 
so uh, I would definitely echo the call for this to be uh, an opportunity for greater transparency and data collection moving forward. One of the uh, gaps in the published evidence I neglected to mention is really much of anything that looked at these questions with regard to SARS-CoV-1 about 15 years ago, uh, as well as MERS. And it may have been because the first SARS kind of burnt itself out before uh, it really became a widespread global pandemic, and MERS was also geographically confined. But there were potential lessons to be learned because there were some similarities in symptomatology, maybe some differences in infectivity and case fatality, but there were some lessons that could have been learned and applied here. So the hope of moving forward with that would be that um, this serves as the, the platform for learning those lessons moving forward. Thank you. Um, we have uh, a few more questions from uh, um, the audience. One I picked out just now, um, and it's quite topical, Yacht and Anna, because the three of us have been talking offline about precisely this, um, this issue. So the question is, various groups have published disease models with different results. How should policymakers decide which one to believe? Are there reporting guidelines or appraisal tools for modeling? <laughs> Yacht, what, what, what do you think? Uh, that is very challenging. I, I, um, as I inform, actually, uh, many countries, I think these are maker, especially in low middle income countries, they are not familiar with modeling. I think it's uh, one of a few countries that I work at the beginning. Then when we talk about modeling, they say, why, why you need to do modeling? I'm not going to buy any shirt, any, <laughs> any suit, <laughs> why you need modeler? I, I, so maybe, but this, I think it's, we need to prepare them, uh, but I think this time is uh, forcing them to be well prepared too. So decision maker, I think this time they are open uh, to uh, researcher to explain them, and they will listen patiently. So this is a good thing. So, uh, but again, as Calypso said, you have local models tell you one thing, and then you also have um, global modelers. You have regional modelers or tell you another story, etc. in your own country. I think that is confusing. And I, 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 I didn't say it's not good, but it's, I think it's, it's, it can be good if, if there can be a guidance for them uh, to let them understand and be able to select the right model to answer the right questions. I didn't say any model are wrong, actually. Uh, I'm sure they are, can be useful for, for some reasons and for some uh, situations. But uh, these makers need to be able to choose the right model to answer the right questions that they have. And then they be able to interpret the result correctly. And they, they also need to be able to make judgment on that model. Those kind of things, I hope that I think uh, this um, I, I understand that I decided to show World Bank, uh, Bill Melinda Gates Foundation is trying to first try to to work on developing. We, so we plan to work with uh, local decision makers in a few countries, in low income mm -hmm. countries, trying to develop a guide, a, a guide, a guidance for them to be able to do what I said. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we're trying to con, trying to uh, conduct a uh, multi-model comparisons that perhaps. We can bring different model, different modelers to come together, trying to understand the difference between model and trying to uh, give information for the user. Uh, we don't know which one right or wrong because only God who know. But if even we know uh, this model is different from another model, how how big difference between these two? I think that is already good enough, and we understand why they are different. And what is the difference in terms of pop their objective, et cetera? That is, we have a lot uh, for, for people to use. So I, as I inform, don't let this maker, don't let the public down of using evidence to inform policy. So I think this is a time. For, uh, so I would like to call for cooperation from uh, uh, researchers around the world uh, to work together on this one with the virtual World Bank, uh, IDSI, and Gates Foundation. Thank you. Anna, how do we tell which one is the right model? 
I don't know. I, I agree with you. But I, I, obviously, there are models with errors and there are models which, which are not necessarily of the right quality. But I think a diversity of models is important when, a, when, when you're modeling something new because different modelers are going to take different approaches and highlight different areas that they think are important. So I don't necessarily think the aim is to have all the models saying the same um, result. I do think, and I, I really don't want to speak on, on their behalf, but um, I do think that most of the people who are expert in infectious disease modeling at the moment are under a lot of pressure and the type of work that they're producing sort of reflects that. They're, ha they're being asked to turn around results at a speed that they normally don't. Um, and so the write up of that work becomes quite diminished. Much of it isn't peer reviewed. So the normal checks that would exist that would allow the, you know, the policy maker, because it would have gone through peer review, it would have had all that cleaning up, all that would have been very open, just are not done in the time frame. And there's definitely a trade off between a decision maker wanting a result tomorrow and having the time to be um, transparent and do the modeling at the kind of quality level that has been done, say, in TB or HIV and other other areas. So I think it's a difficult thing. I don't think we're going to have as high quality models all the time for COVID in this situation as we do for other diseases that will will come in time. There are ways of assessing models. Um, we worked, at, and again, I'm only speaking of one effort, and it's it's just to give an example, but we worked with the Global Front on, on sort of the ways that they can have a checklist to assess the different TB models okay. that are used at the country level, what should be reported, and how can they understand them. So I think there are a whole range of of tools that are out there, and I, I completely agree with Yacht. I think one of that those of us who are working cl more closely on the policy end should actually, you know, focus on some of these areas. We're maybe not the best sort of disease modelers ourselves or analysts, or well, some of us are not, but what we can do is look at that sort of interaction and have these frameworks, um, being aware that the normal, you know, that if we hold these th this high sort of quality standard out there that we wouldn't get the results at the speed we need them. So it does have to be adapted. I think we do need some flexibility in current guidelines given a sort of pandemic um, situation. I know there's been talks of, of, of comparing different models. Um, and again, I think that was done, the Bolan has been done in many different diseases. I mean, being part of those efforts, those, those are hugely time consuming efforts. You have to get all the models to align all the parameters, everything they're doing to then see what is the true difference between the models versus the assumptions and data that goes into the models. That might be worth doing. But again, it's a, it's a trade off between wanting a diversity and quick results now versus asking modeling groups to spend their time on those sort of comparative and, and, and reporting issues. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't perfectly answer the question, but I think our, at least the job of us more on the HTA end is, is to provide the, the, the frame for decision makers. Thanks. Thank you. I, I Thank would you. just, uh, oh, sorry. Go sorry, ahead, Dan. I was going to bring you in. Okay. Just uh, to interject something that Anna mentioned before, so I think this also highlights the, the benefits of open source. So with, with epidemiology, proof of concept comes through replication, and so that's not possible unless someone has access to the code. And it's also the case, as both Yad and, and Anna mentioned, that, that these disease modeling groups are doing this under enormous pressure, daily pressure. That means the opportunity for error increases. And so uh, the, the ability to have others review that code, try to replicate it, check models against each other, I think is, is much more pronounced. And uh, if all of these groups agree to be open source and there are resources available to do that, I think that is a, uh, that's an opportunity we should try to take advantage of. Um, shameless little plug, there is an open source clearinghouse as part of our global health registry. So. Models can be submitted to that clearinghouse, code can be shared, documentation can be shared, uh, and it's any model of any type. It's not necessarily a, a cost effectiveness model. So, uh, so that is a possibility. There are other repositories out there as well that have been promoted. So I think that that's, that's a key effort that should be undertaken, not just to try to understand differences between models, but to find out if there are flaws that we need to be aware of. Absolutely. Absolutely. I just I want to say, yeah. Important. Please go ahead, Anna. 
No, no, no. I was, I, I was, I was going to agree with that. I think already people are sort of within the modeling community. I know even in the economics community, we're sharing things early just to learn rapidly from each other. So apart from the error checking, we actually need to let, we're, we're sort of all learning as, uh, as doing and, and, and it's not that efficient that we're all learning the same thing. So that's another reason to encourage open source um, sharing during this time. Absolutely. The stake, the stake this time, yeah, the stake this time very high because many models inform mm -hmm. uh, policy for 100 million. It's not only for one disease group, but maybe even in some countries is a billion populations. So I would say, yeah, I, I'm totally agree with Anna and, and uh, that I think uh, researchers try to do their best. And, with limited resource they have and limited time, but it doesn't mean that they, they can ignore the quality and they cannot, can ignore the accuracy of the estimate that they're going to present and it's going to be used. So I, I would like to say maybe we need to back balance and trying to ensure that we cannot this time go for proper peer review, but we should have such kind of maybe calibrations, uh, validations, or even learning for each other, et cetera. And open source is, of, of course, is one, if, one way. But it's, that's, but it's not mean that every country have capacity uh, to be able to evaluate the model. So I think they need uh, expertise. And I would like to say that multi-model comparison is still a way to go. And I, I think that is perhaps much shorter and much resource consumed compared to uh, peer review publication, etc. Thank you, Jot, with all the caveats. So I've got three questions I'd like to put to you and then uh, you guys sort of uh, volunteer which ones you'd like to take. Uh, they're the sort of uh, related, especially the first two. Uh, the first two have to do with data. So uh, data on marginalized groups, a colleague is asking, how do we make sure we collect more and better data on the most marginalized, both in terms of uh, how these populations could be protected? And Anna mentioned that one of the policy options protected from COVID, uh, but also from the impact, um, health impact, or perhaps wider social impact of the COVID measures on those populations. What do we need to measure? How can we measure it better? Uh, who's responsible for collecting this information on marginalized groups? That's one. Second question on routinely collected data systems. Um, is this the time to make a pitch and alongside open source, open access, uh, also to uh, on the importance of investing in uh, data collection systems? Um, and again, uh, where is the funding coming from? Uh, how important uh, have routinely collected data been so far in informing uh, the modeling exercises? Um, and who needs to put effort into, into doing, uh, cleaning the data, et cetera, et cetera, where these data sets exist. And a third one, perhaps this is for you, Anna, more, more than the others, is about uh, the extent to which the latest transmission models or indeed the uh, economic models being developed uh, integrate uh, behavioral science and implementation science uh, in, in the modeling. So human behavior, do you, do you take this into account? Uh, do models do that? Uh, now or perhaps in the short, uh, sort of immediate future. So marginalized groups, uh, data, routinely collected data, and uh, behavioral science. Who would like to start? Anna, would you like to start? Thank you. Well, I'll start on the last one and I'll leave the other ones because I think I've already said a little bit about um, the behavioral and, and implementation science. I mean, I think both are critical. The challenge is how do we get the data? So as I say, there's one option, which is to review the data sources we have on health systems and behavior in, in countries. And there's a whole range of smaller, and it's about reviewing, pooling, co collecting those data sources together. I'm not sure that's been clearly defined or, or done yet. Maybe there are people who are doing it. I know that's one thing we're looking at starting at doing at the London School is having sort of in, improving our systematic reviews, but I would say focusing our systematic reviews. But the other thing we've been looking at is, is linking onto existing data systems. Can we pick up the data items we need? And I know in the UK, they've been looking at rapid behavioral surveys, for example, over mobile phones, et cetera. Can we can we collect data and, and the Calypso, you mentioned real time responses, sort of changes in social behavior. 
we've tried to um, we're very used to doing face to face interviews. And obviously there's bias in using mobile phone data. <laughs> but that is something we're exploring is very short surveys of about 20 minutes that can be done to actually pick up changes and key behaviors that will inform the, the, the models and also both economic and health related behaviors. Mm. So I would say watch this space. And again, I'm sure many other groups are, are working on this area. I mean, the other thing is just to say the routinely collected data systems, um, particularly that which is available globally, are often years out of date on some of the basic things like how many beds people are there in, country, in countries. I think there is an effort being made by many of the global and, and, and sort of national governments to get on top of that. So I do think we're getting improvement already improvements in those areas, but that's not replacing the kind of investments in HMIS that we, we really need. I think it's more ad hoc going after Pacific data items. Um, but I, I agree. These are key areas moving forward. Um, and I can see emerging tools and, and systems being set up at, at the moment, but I, I, I don't see re any sort of real results yet in low middle income countries. Thank you, Anna. Dan? Yeah, I might take the uh, the routine data collection um, uh, thread forward as well. Uh, so it's interesting, about 10 years ago or so, uh, I taught a course on uh, biosurveillance. And uh, this was around the time that there was a lot of public concern about the possibility of bi a bioterrorism incident uh, and whether there were routine data that could be brought to bear for uh, pathogen detection and control. Uh, and there are. So uh, at the time, Google had their sort of ill-fated health analytics group. They'd done some really interesting validation work with the CDC here in the U.S. to uh, use search terminology frequency uh, as a means to track seasonal flu trends. And it was really interesting and, and um, a quite valid approach. Other data sets, including purchasing data from supermarkets and pharmacies, um, could be used for sort of an early detection or early warning system. But those efforts have really sort of gone silent since um, since that time. And it seems as though there's a renewed call for something like that, whether it's bioterrorism or simply an in emerging infectious disease. Now, obviously, a lot of those data sets are fit for purpose and easily and used on a widespread basis in high income settings not necessarily the case in low middle income countries, uh, but at least those that have a substantial enough level of internet access could use some of these tools um, for detection, monitoring, and control. Okay, I leave no Thank choice to, to choose on the marginalized group. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, I, it's, it's always challenging, actually, uh, to be honest, uh, to talk to uh, this group of population, not only COVID, but in every uh, health policies, even public policy. Uh, but I think one thing that I, I, I would like to perhaps uh, mention that I think for for COVID situation, I think one good thing that I can see is that the way that the world are counting COVID cases, COVID death, is that, that they are not my whether the death is in your country is from uh, people in who are uh, holding the passport, for example, in Thailand, when we call dead, we call infection, it's not people who are holding Thai's ID identity, but everybody who are living in Thailand who are identified case and dead in Thailand, we count. So I think that case is, I, I believe it is a norm. Because in other countries, I thought the same thing, that they are counting. So I think this is perhaps you put, you put accountability to the, to the government trying to perhaps protect everybody who are living in their own country. But the matter is whether those people can access mm -hmm. to care and can also um, uh, make the government recognize when they're dying from the disease. But I'm worrying is that for non-COVID cases, the world is not counting uh, death mortalities, uh, morbidities in that way. I think perhaps this is something that we, perhaps we can learn after COVID. Thank you. Thank you. So we're coming to uh, a close. I would like to thank uh, Jot, Dan, Anna for taking the time and sharing their insights with us. I would like to thank all of you for uh, watching and sharing your questions and again taking the time. Um,
A couple of thoughts from me, parting thoughts. This is a global crisis. We're in it together, high income, middle income, low income, and within each country, the poor and the wealthier. And we need to remember that. And perhaps that's one of the very few positives that this crisis will leave us with, as Yacht said. Uh, we shouldn't be having to show our passport uh, when, when we measure the impact and the response. Uh, secondly, common sense. Common sense in the way policies are implemented, in the way evidence is released, communicated, interpreted. Uh, thirdly, emphasis on data collection so we can refine the response real time, improve um, as we do what we're trying to do, doing our best. Uh, and then finally, process, due process in communicating, including communicating uncertainty, engaging policymakers, engaging the press, the parliament. Uh, to get the message out there, this perhaps is an opportunity in the midst of the tragedy for evidence and science to shine and to guide us out of this. Uh, but there's also risks that uh, we might end up uh, with a backlash. So it's really critical that uh, the information is communicated properly and with respect to people's values and to the local realities in the different settings uh, that are being targeted. So with that, thank you very much for uh, tuning in, for listening to us, and stay well, stay safe. Take care. Bye. Thank you.